Austin. I'm Callie. And this is episode two of our k and Swing podcast and our first video episode because I know you wanted to see my beautiful face. Oh, that's that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to those who listened to us the first time. It was really exciting trying this out for the first time and we had so much fun. We thought, why not add a video into the mix? Mm -hmm. And if y'all want to hear our first episode and you haven't seen it, I'm going to go ahead and post a link below. Yeah! So today I had a lot of thoughts, which is not unusual from any other day. Yeah, if you didn't know how this podcast got started was just the fact that Callie always asks me these questions. And then a coach of ours was like, y'all should definitely just do a podcast because it's really inspiring questions. So the, the whole idea is she asks questions, I answer questions, she answers questions, and hopefully you at home can think about it yourself. Yeah, and usually this is, obviously this is from our perspective. So this is from a two professional all-star level West Coast swing dancers. Mm -hmm. And of course everyone's got their own different, you know, perspective, but this is just coming from ours. For what it's worth, which yes. is a lot, because obviously we're always right. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, one of the first things that uh, I wanted to talk about today was like, what made you want to turn dancing into a career? Uh, so for me, when it comes to the idea of making dance a career, it really became something a little bit more tangible whenever I started getting to travel a lot more. Um, I never really thought about this as a career until I had spent so much money in it. <laughs> um, it was a hobby, definitely a hobby, all throughout college. I would work 32 hours a week just so I could make enough money to travel and I still got myself into debt. Don't recommend it. Um, yeah, and funny. I eventually got to a point where I had spent so much money on dancing that I had to make some of my money back. Uh, so that transition for me was just kind of necessary to continue to fund my dream of getting to dance and have a great time. And I just love the, the community of it, so. I, th I think that's fair. I, I know for you it's very community-based and we we talk a lot about why we dance. Mm -hmm. It's a very integral part of moving throughout competition or through careers and things. Yeah. I, I know for myself, I wasn't the best figure skater, so obviously most people think, oh, well, you think about who's gonna make it to the Olympics. That wasn't me. Uh, so. If y'all didn't know, Callie was a semi-professional figure skater growing up. So Woo. she left from that to come into West Coast Swing, so. Yeah, and uh, so for me, the the idea that literally the first time I ever saw West Coast Swing, I saw, I was, I was 19 years old and I saw people of all ages. I saw this 96 year old lady dancing out there and everyone was like, oh, she's amazing. You know, you're so young. And, and I was being overly dramatic, but it's it's whatever. I was like, you think I'm young? Oh, this is beautiful. And from then on, I wanted to try this as a career. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure we were always going to the same dance places and they would look at us and be like, you're so young, you're starting so early. We wish you, we started when we were in, the, in our 20s. Yeah. And come to find out that's because a lot of them started when they were in their 50s and 60s and so just the fact that this dance is so ageless is awesome and so that that definitely inspired me a little bit too did you ever think you'd make it this far in dancing not this far um i definitely thought of myself as getting to a point where i could probably be an all-star so like i said i started just doing this for fun and then whenever i got to uh the point that i wanted to teach i had I personally had a goal of getting to all-star so that I could teach because I personally didn't feel comfortable teaching until I was an all-star. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I always pictured myself kind of plateauing at all-star, being like, okay, I got there, I can teach now. And it wasn't until we partnered that I thought I could be more. Mm -hmm. And even then, I still didn't really think of myself as being one of the best of the best. And, I'm, and I know I'm not that yet, but I would like to be one day. So, um, no. <laughs> but... <laughs> But it was really interesting because I never thought of myself as being open and creative and being at top of the top. I was great at replicating what other people taught me or replicating um, what I was learning in lessons and seeing in other competitions, but I would never innately create. And I feel that that's what it takes to be the best of the best is to consistently 
challenge yourself and to consistently create and think of new ways and innovative ways to change the dance. And that isn't how I described myself in the past. And it wasn't until recently that I started thinking that I could do that. Um, so my perception of myself and where I could be in this dance has definitely changed as I've gone on. I think I think that's actually a, a good outlook. You, I feel like you came in very realistic <laughs> of what was possible, and then maybe you surprised yourself as you went on. Yeah, I definitely think <laughs> I definitely think that I set my standards low. I guess um, I feel that a lot of people in West Coast Swing, specifically, I think their dream is always, oh, I want to get to All Star. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever. I, I very very rarely hear people say, oh, I want to be a champion. And I feel it's just because there's just this big gap from all-star to champion. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, champion is the top level uh, for our competitions that are not routine based. And so champion is like the top of the top and all-star is the level underneath that. Mm -hmm. So it's still, there's a lot of professionals in that division, however, it's not the tippy top of the top. Yeah. Yeah, so I feel that the majority of people, I think, had my goal. Um, a lot of lower level dancers that I talk to are always like, oh, I wanna get to, I wanna get to All-Star, I wanna get to All-Star. Very few of them tell me that they actually wanna be champions. And so I think that most people feel that that's attainable. I feel like a lot of people set the goal to be an attainable one. Mm -hmm. And I feel that All-Star is very attainable um, for almost any dancer because everyone can work and learn and, and everybody's journey is different, but yeah. it's, it's definitely achievable. Yeah, I think I think that for myself, like, like I said, I feel like you went in so realistic and I'm that kid who goes, I wanna be an astronaut. And you know, people look at me and go, sure kid, hey, kid. Yeah. reach for the stars. Here's your Toy Story doll. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for me, I, I, funny enough, it's both. There's yeah. there's not much of an in-between. I remember sitting at a competition called America's Classic that was in Houston, so we miss it, but it was yeah. great. Um, and I remember watching the intermediate division and thinking, I am never going to be that good, just ever. They These, these girls were creative and they were smooth and despite what people assume about figure skating and oh you're gonna be fantastic at this you know dancing will be no problem oh it was a problem <laughs> sure well you were there i was there <laughs> it was a problem <laughs> <laughs> so i had i had athletic qualities that i could use later but not at the beginning stages and so it was just really really bad and part of me never thought I could make it into intermediate, let alone any upper divisions. And then the other part of me was, you know, one day I'm gonna be in champions and I'm gonna be the best. Yeah, that's the side <laughs> that she would actually tell people. Very few times she'd be like, I don't even think I can make it to intermediate. She would always be the one that after not making a semi and novice, she would be like, I'm gonna be a champion. And I just sat there looking at her thinking she was crazy. It because, seems like a pipe dream. Yeah, because you just not made a semi and novice or something, so. Yeah, and, and I think that there's something to be said about understanding where you're at and where your ultimate goal is. And I don't know if you ever feel that way where it's, okay, I'm, I'm happy with where I'm at, but there are still places to go. Yeah, I think for myself, I have a very specific feeling that I always feel, um, and if I feel it, I know that I'm getting complacent. Mm -hmm. uh, for myself, if I don't feel nervous going out onto the floor for either a routine run or for a Jack and Jill or for a Strictly, if I don't feel nerves, then I know I've stopped pushing myself. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's really an interesting thing that I had to learn going from this is a hobby and a dream as going into it as a career because I got complacent where we, we, got, we had been running our routine so much and, and I was just happy to be a part of the show. Once I got to Showcase, which is the professional division in West Coast Swing for routines with lifts, um, once I got there, I just didn't really feel like I belonged. I was really nervous. And so I had to tell myself, hey, you're part of the show. Like that's your, you're a part of the ticket price for people to get in because they wanna see 
you and they want to see the showcase division. And so I had to tell myself that, but then that was great at first to get me more into motivated. it, more motivated into it. Mm -hmm. But then it started actually being a deterrent of working harder and because I got complacent. I stopped being nervous because I was like, oh, I'm part of the show. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to win. I'm not going to, I'm not really competing. I'm, I'm a part of the show. And so I've learned that if I start to not be nervous, it means I'm getting complacent. And it's never been a deterrent of, I don't want to push harder. It's just a realization of, oh, I am where I am, but that's not where I want to finish. And I think that that specific feeling for me really drives me a lot. You know, you know what's funny about that? I, <laughs> so I think the one thing is Austin and I have very different mindset. They kind of coincide and at the same time, I find that you tend to be more middle headed, mm -hmm. like level headed, and I tend to jump between extremes. Extremes, yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> for me, when we first got to the professional division, there's there's this part of me that wanted to be like, yes, and now we're gonna be the best, and you live happily ever after, roll credits, go. And then there's the very realistic thing of, wow, there's been people here who are undefeated. There's been people here who have been competing longer than I'm alive. Yep. And um, I think my mom said it best, where it was our first time in the professional division of Showcase. And I, I texted her and I, I'm so nervous, mom. I, I look up to these people and I'm competing against them and I know I'm not gonna place, but it, it's so nerve wracking. And my mom, I, I love this. I absolutely love this mindset, so don't take it the wrong way. My mom just goes, Callie, it's not really a competition if you know who's gonna win. <laughs> so, so I always looked at it at that point on of, oh, I'm not really competing against these people. And truly, I shouldn't even be comparing myself to them. I should just be improving myself because I can't yeah. control them. I can't, yeah. I can't control what music they play, how well they do, if they point their toes. I should be able to control that, but you know, things happen. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I enjoyed that idea that it should be less about the competition and more about focusing on what you want to do and what your goals are going out there. Yeah, that's really true. Um, I know for myself, the minute that I stopped seeing as many results um, in competition, it was really hard for me. And I had to really change my mentality of, okay, I'm gonna work on this one thing. And if I can leave these dances feeling this way that I worked on this and I, and I showed it, then great. And if that results me in a better placement, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but it was, I had to pick one thing to consistently better myself. So I get that. Now, I know with obviously this crazy amount of time where we've had off for several months now, mm -hmm. everyone's had off, there's no dance events, uh, potentially for the next year or so, we don't really know. What kind of timeline do you see yourself in five years? It's like the age old saving question. Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that's a really hard question to answer right now. Because um, I feel that I have a plan A and a plan B. Yeah. Um, for plan A, obviously, if events can come back and that starts happening again in, in a year or something along those lines, then I feel that we're still on track with what we had been planning on. Yeah. Um, so we've been partners for about three or four years. Well, we've had three or four years of routines. Um, mm -hmm. And every, it's ran just like a normal business where on average, most businesses run three to five years at not breaking or not breaking even yet. Yeah, until and you so, kind of hit that either break even or go out. Exactly. And so yeah. I feel that we were on schedule to make a profit this year and, and actually like make our way up. Um, and so I feel that we'll still hopefully be on that trajectory um, whenever events start back up. So that would be my plan A, obviously, is is let's continue working on ourselves. We're still trying to practice as much as we can. I'm still trying to work out at least four or five days a week. So we're really trying to focus on us. Yeah. And, and so plan A would be that. 
though we do have, like, I know I have a backup plan of, okay, well, like I have these connections with these different people and I can talk to these people. Uh, I have a degree in film and uh, film editing. And so that's something that I can kind of fall back on. So I do have a plan B of if this didn't work out, what my life would look like, right? And, and I think that everybody should always do that whenever you're starting any business, regardless if it's West Coast Swing or otherwise, mm -hmm. you should always have your plan A, but then you always should have a fallback because if you invest all your eggs in that one basket and then it flops, then you have to start from ground zero. And so um, I know for myself, I have that plan A and then my plan B is just falling back on some of the connections that I made over the course of the years and then falling back on my degree, possibly going back to school maybe, you never know, like we have a lot of different options. Yeah. Especially because we did start so young in comparison to some, right? So um, that's that's been a really interesting thought process that I've had to deal with during all the COVID stuff. And I, I think that it's actually kind of a cool thing because it makes you confront what is and yep. confront your options instead of, you know, well, I, when it first started, both of us, okay, so we have a few weeks, so let's just keep working few weeks more, okay. Motivation starts to take this nice little nose dive and soon you're on this roller coaster down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, we've had this conversation a lot where I might, like for myself, I find motivation in seeing change mm -hmm. and seeing the benefit of my work, right? So if we don't have competitions to see how our work is paying off in essence, right? Because a competition is kind of like a report card. I don't look at the competition as, oh, I won against this person, or oh, I beat this person, or no, no, no. I look at it as a report card, or I look at it as, How okay, does that I, go again? A report card. Nah, nah, nah. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. I, I look at it as a report card. So if I'm working on X, Y, and Z thing, and then I go to this event, and I see positive things, I make semis, or I make finals, or I make whatever, or in our routine, we, we place higher than we did before, then I look at it as we're at least moving in the correct trajectory. But if you don't have those, it's really hard for me personally to maintain a motivation for something that we don't even know when the next event will be. And so you just have to kind of remind yourself of like the sun will come out tomorrow. Well, you know, you never know, but you're, you're working towards something. Yeah, I think it's a little different for me in the way of, um, since this started as a passion, it's it's hard for me not to want to go back to it being a passion, you know? Yeah. I, I enjoy performing. I, that's my little drug, if you will. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds weird, but getting, getting to go out and perform, that's always my thing. And so holding on to that concept of, no, this is the time where you get to make those performances worth it. Because if you go off the floor and people give you the, what is it? That was a really uh, good song choice. Yeah. It was, did you wear socks? I think you wore socks. I love your eyeliner. You know, you don't feel good. You know, You know what that means. That means your routine was not okay. You didn't do much right, and at that point, obviously, you feel a little more strained, you feel more apprehensive about performing yeah. if things aren't going well. But then there's those other times you go out and people feel moved by it. They go, oh, I love the story that you told. I could see the emotion on your face. I could tell what journey you were trying to really describe, and I felt that, and that's when I go, ooh, Ooh, I've been practicing. I got my job. Like that was what I was doing. Yeah. You know, and so for for me that that kind of couple years, you know, even if there's a year off, two years off, whatever it is, I can I can really pick. You know, for me since I love routines, I can pick a song that I really love. I can pick choreo. You know, the that really I can spice up and I can play with. And that way, the next time I perform, I can try and secure myself that, oh, that routine, guys. Ooh, I want the, I want the oof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know there have been a lot of times where even if, even when we feel that, we get that that adrenaline rush of, oh, all these people loved it, and oh, oh we've had all these things, positive things. Like I feel that, and then if the result 
competitively isn't there, then that has also fueled us so much of, oh, we're going to go home. We're going to work. We're going to get mm, so much better. Yeah. And it gives you that hunger again. And, and that's hard to remind yourself of, or at least I, I think it's hard. Like I, I have a hard time reminding myself of, oh, hey, remember that feeling of hunger and that burn and that fire you wanted to like get better. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's another thing that I'm having to like figure out how to reinstill in myself without having competition around. That's true. Yeah. You need like extrangent motivation. Yeah. Isn't that what the word is? Yeah. Extrinsic. Extrinsic. Ex ex Good. Yeah. Words, words are hard. <laughs> I, I have that internal motivation. Yeah. I, for me, I'll never forget the time we, we performed, we got notes back from the judges, and one of the notes back was, oh, I, they just wanted it more than you did. And I was so angry oh that was fire I ain't nobody wants something more than that want something I heard about this for a year that's how much it drove her insane burned in my brain it honestly the most genuine best answer that someone could have told me because for me I get fired up if, if somebody says oh you didn't work hard enough I take pride in being a hard worker yeah. so if somebody's gonna outwork me they ain't gonna never see hard work before. Yeah. I'm gonna put that much more time and effort into it. So yeah, you know, surprisingly, as much as it, it sucked to receive that feedback, that was that was kind of a drive. I can see that. Which, you know, with with this downtime, I guess that is one of the, I would say one of the more negative things. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's there's positive thing. Of, you know, what are the positives, I guess, for you that you've seen through having downtime? Um, for me, I, it's taught me a lot more about self-discipline and setting a schedule for myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's also given me a lot of time to spend with my family and with other like personal relationships. And so getting to actually invest in those is really nice. So those are some positives. I can also say that um, one of the positives would be the fact that I do see personal drive in myself mm -hmm. and that's something that I hadn't really seen because you're right like most of my motivators are extrinsic and so finding those intrinsic motivators help um, this might sound really kind of rude or mean but one of my favorite or not favorite I can't say favorite one thing that helped motivate me um, was actually seeing that I was working and seeing other people not work because it made me feel like I was like, oh, I'm I'm working. Get right? him! I'm getting him, right? Yeah. And so so it and that sounds weird, but it 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 helped motivate me because it made me realize, oh hey, I'm doing something to better myself and and to get further in my passion and in my career that somebody else isn't doing. You know. And so it it just made me feel very invigorated to keep doing that because it, if I viewed that person as above me or better than me or anything along those lines. Then it's like, oh, I can catch them. They're 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 sleeping. I can I can catch up. I can I can work. I can work. And and that was one of the hardest things for me growing up in this dance was I would always give myself the excuse of, oh well, that person like some of the top champions in our dance have been a professional dancer longer than I've even been dancing. Period. And so I would always use that partially as a reminder of, hey, it's okay you're not expected to be this person yet. And then also sometimes I've used it as an excuse of saying like, oh, hey, uh, well, I obviously I'm not gonna be that good because they've been doing this and this and this. But seeing those, those some, of the, some of these people just kind of hang out or getting to talk to some of them, it really motivated me because I'm like, oh, if I'm working and they're not, I can catch, I can move, I can, I can get better. And it was a really big motivator for me for a second. I mean, you say it, you say it that it's bad, but realistically, whenever you see people running a race, if you're a hair behind, if you're in second place and you're a hair behind the first place person, that's going to motivate you to catch up to them. Yeah. Whereas if that person is a mile up the road, you're like, ah, I mean, I'm still 
second even if I don't make any strides on that. Yeah, well, and I guess in that analogy, right, if, if you're running and they're running and you can't really tell the difference of me gaining on them, I'm just going to be like, okay, well, we're just running at our own paces and it's fine. And, and That's it's, what I mean. And, you and kind of settle get, yeah. for being second but then seeing, versus chasing. Yeah, exactly. But seeing that person, if they're in front of me, they're like, oh, they're taking a water break. I'm like, oh, I can catch them. <laughs> and, so, yeah. and so that's that's been a really big drive for me, too, that I view as a positive. So Yeah. Has it affected any of your, I guess, dance goals or your business goals? For business goals, definitely. Um, not necessarily within dance itself, but it has opened my mentality towards multiple sources of income instead of just dance, right? Mm -hmm. Because if events are a part of your income and events aren't happening anymore, it really does push you to figure out all the other avenues that you can utilize dance in. Um, one of the biggest arguments that Callie and I always have is if I'm like, oh, well, we, we, need, we really need to make this extra money here or there or whatever. And my answer is always, oh, well, I could go get a job here or I could go do this or I could do that. And Callie always cringes like she is right now and she's always like, Austin, you've put all this time, money, and energy into dance, and yet that isn't your go-to for making more profit in some form or fashion. And so this time has been really beneficial for our business of just discussing different things of how we can utilize our dance experience and our dance knowledge to open up other forms of income and different avenues. Um, and that's been a really positive thing for the business side of it. Yeah, I mean, one thing we talked about even just yesterday um, when you were kind of mentioning, oh, yeah, well, I don't want to have put in tons of money, you know, putting into when we transitioned into a business, right? Not as a hobby, but whenever you transition into business, a lot of money goes places you don't expect it to or you have to spend more than you expect it to. And uh, you were mentioning how you didn't want all of that money to have gone to waste, mm -hmm. to which I, I I was like, you realize you have a bachelor's degree that you don't use. So in theory, you've already spent a bunch of money to not get any money back out of something. Hey, it's a really good safety net, okay? It's my it, plan B. It's a good safety net, <laughs> but at the same time, look at, look at what dancing has given to both of us, being very kind of shy. I know for myself, I was very shy for you, very kind of naive, very trusting of people. And I think that you start to look at things more critically now, instead mm -hmm. of just taking the face value of things. I do. I think you, both of us present ourselves better, you know, where you, you might've been like, oh, hey, I'm awesome, cool. Like whatever goes, whatever goes. And I tended to be more like, Hi, I'm Callie. Here's an awkward wave. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, hi, I'm Callie Casas. Here is your official awkward wave and bye. <laughs> Same awkward wave, different presentation. Just louder volumes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, even if, even if dancing never paid me another dollar, some of the things that I've learned from it definitely can be applicable outside of dance, right? Yeah. I've learned that if you give yourself a value then and you present it as such then people will take you for that value right if i show up to a judging assignment and i'm just slouched over and i'm not really going to be there it's not going to be overly presentable and nobody's going to take my opinion as seriously right yeah or if i'm over here like oh well if you want to pay me this amount for a lesson uh, i guess it's that would be okay right nobody's going to be as confident but i've, I've learned that if you're like, hey, this is my price, and this is this is what you're getting for that price, and you're very confident in what you're selling, in essence, then your buyer is going to be a lot more apt to buy, and that can be applicable to any type of job interview. That can be applicable to any type of job. Thinking of it from the sense of, I know something that Callie and I do specifically for West Coast Swing that I would take outside of this would be, we want to be the most professional we can when we're at an event. We're gonna be the ones that are 15 minutes early. We're gonna be the ones that stay 15 minutes late if we need to. We're always there, always able to help. And I've learned from West Coast specifically that if I take that outside of West Coast, if I take that to a normal job, if I make myself invaluable at that job and I'm always the one that's the hard worker, then I'm always gonna be the one that 
gets a leg up on everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's something that West Coast has taught me. Even if I don't get another dollar from West Coast, then I have some, some things that I've learned from it that I can take to other things. I think, I think the two most valuable things that I have learned through this journey has really been, A, that you have self-worth, mm -hmm. right? Like we all might think that, but then when we have to tell somebody else, whether it be in a job interview or if it's telling somebody what your price is and sticking by it, you know, there's kind of like how you said, oh, my price is my price. I think that there's something very real to acknowledge that what we can say to somebody and what we feel internally are two different things. Yep. So, you know, you see a professional and they go, oh, my price is X, Y, Z, and they have no problem telling you that. That doesn't mean that our armpits aren't sweating. As I, we say it, you know, some, some people, bless them, they've got the confidence out the wazoo and they don't mind telling you nothing. Yep. They got some boldness. I ain't got that boldness. I'm over here trying to fan my shirt out as I'm like, um, this is my prize and uh, I think you'll really like it. And I'm, I, I, I'm smart. I know words. <laughs> Great sales pitch. Yeah. So I've, I've had to just get more comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. I think that that, A, that's the, the first thing that it taught me. And then B, I think the most important thing that West Coast Swing has taught me in the business sense is absolutely everybody is self-conscious. Yeah. I don't care who you are, how big of britches you put up, what, how, how great the concrete on the wall you built up is. There is something self-conscious about you. And when you have, I think dancing and like playing, singing are very similar where our instrument is our body. So when you say, oh, you're not really good at playing the trumpet, you can make an excuse of, oh, well that's cause see, I dropped the trumpet, like this piece of the trumpet and it's a little bent. And see, see that's why that noise is there, you know, or yeah. oh, this. But whenever it, you are your instrument, it becomes very personal. Yeah. You know, so somebody says, hey, you need to work on your quality of movement just as a whole. Sometimes people are very accepting of that and go, oh, you're right, I totally do. And that's the way that they handle their self, like issues, self-confidence issues. And then other people are like, oh, I need to work on my quality of movement. You need to work on your face. You know, just... <laughs> I personally have never heard that come back, but I'm sure someone might have th thought it at some point in time. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's like a level of defensiveness, right? Yeah that people have when they receive information on their body, when the body's the instrument. Yeah, I can right? agree with that. Like in, in dancing, there are standards, even though West Coast Swing, and I will say, West Coast Swing 100% is the most boz body positive sport you could possibly ever have, ever. You yeah. know, we don't care what size you are, we don't care what shape you are, height you are whatever you are but that being said right in showcase we do lifts yep so if i decide to eat a bunch of cupcakes and you can no longer lift me it's not a personal jab yeah at me that you can no longer lift me either a which is the real answer you just need to work out until you're strong enough to lift the new heavy me <laughs> Just so everyone's aware, Callie says this every time she eats a piece of cake. She's like, oh, I'm just helping you get stronger. Oh, I'm helping you do this. Oh, I'm helping you do that. And then her theory is that right before the Open, which is our biggest event of the year, she'll just lose a bunch of weight because she won't eat those cupcakes and pieces of cake anymore. And so I'll be, she'll be a light as a feather to me. And I try to explain to her that if my body's used to doing a certain thing with a certain weight, that means that I'm not going to be as comfortable when you weigh less because I could do. But she doesn't understand it. I think it's just an excuse, which is fine. You eat all the cupcakes you want, Cal. Thanks. Well, see, I can either, you either have to get stronger or yeah. I have to lose weight. And that's just something that weight is very personal and people get real, you know, touchy with it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something that's interesting with dancing is it's taught me that 
every single person on the planet, doesn't matter how much money they have, how successful they are, there is something you can find about them that they will feel self-conscious about. Yeah. And so it, it has grown my empathy in that way. And when I teach, I can kind of go, oh, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. You shouldn't be so, you know, worried about it. Take a breath. Yeah, it makes sense. It's fine. Well, what type of, I guess, what type of backup plans have you had so far? Uh, so I've had quite a few. Like I said, um, I have quite a few different connections that I've made over the years. I have a friend that works at JP Morgan um, who has pretty much told me, hey, if you, this whole dance thing doesn't work out, you, you should just come work with me. And whole dance thing. This whole dance whole thing. Whole dance thing. So you whole, can forget how to dance. If I don't win the whole open, then I can always come and work with him at JP Morgan. Uh, so that would be one backup plan. I don't know how serious he was about that, but that's that's option one. Option two would be going back to school. And um, I know for myself that I've found a lot of different things that I enjoy, which one of them being actually stocks and finance. So maybe getting a master's in, in finance or business or something along those lines and then trying to find a job in that way. Uh, I also have thought about just going to a normal person job and working nine to five and, and working my way up um, in a, one specific company. Um, so I have a few different thought processor ideas, but nothing is concrete, right? Would you still dance? I think I would end up dancing. It just wouldn't be at the same capacity. Um, I've always stated that the great thing about dance is once you get to a specific level, which for me is all-star, right? At, at an all-star level, you can teach anyone to dance. You can dance if you want to. <laughs> you have friends behind. Because if you can't dance. And your friends don't dance. And they're not real friends of mine. So, um, I do think that at that point, you have enough knowledge to at least get somebody started. So, I've always stated that even if I had a normal person job and I didn't really dance as much, I'd still dance locally, I'd still teach locally. Uh, I'd still go to a couple events a year, especially because for me, it is so communal that I could not I could not not see <laughs> all of my friends from California, from France, from Germany, from Australia, all those places all across America. It would be really difficult for me. Yes, I recognize I named off all the places in Europe. I, I really like across. Germany, America. Yeah, it's, it's my the favorite. Best. But all the places that we've gone to and all the all the friends we've made, yeah. it would be really hard for me never to just see them again. And so I think I would always have to go to a couple events a year and then I would definitely teach at home. Mm -hmm. I think I think that for me, I would I would definitely dance. That's that's not really a thing. I just enjoy dancing. That's kind of my outlet. And I think that regardless, obviously, I I've learned a lot about the business side, and I've always loved math. So something like that, I would be okay with going into math. Uh, or finance, whatever it is. But realistically, I, I like coaching people. Mm -hmm. I like coaching competitive people. Yeah. Because I get to really be specific. It's one thing that I do miss in, in ice skating is how specific coaching would get. Yeah. And you there's there's a level, right? Because there is the understanding of, you, you balance that understanding of we're all self-conscious, we've all got this to yes however we've got places to go yeah and i enjoy when we get past that and we get to work on now we got places to go yeah well and i know that's something that you shared with me that has impacted me a lot is you had stated one of your coaches had told you if they didn't have any critiques for you then that means they just don't believe in you it's true and i i actually take that with all of life like it doesn't matter if it's through dancing and we're receiving coaching, if we are coaching somebody or if I'm working my other jobs, if, if they don't have a critique for me, they don't believe in me. And if I don't have a critique for somebody who I'm trying to make better, it's because I don't believe in them. Yeah. So I never look at those critiques as a personal attack, I'm, I actually usually thank people 
when they say, hey, Callie, you really need to go home. You need to do your homework on this. It doesn't matter if it's like anatomy or you need to learn, you know, more about the finance side. You need to learn more about advertising. Yeah. I look at that as a thank you so much because you're not only believing in me enough to give me something, but as a coach, you're giving me the tools to take your job eventually. Yeah. If you don't want someone to take your job, you take the ability to have that knowledge away. So yep. the fact that somebody is willing to give me that knowledge, and yeah, you could say, oh, they just want money. But on the other hand, it also means that they believe that you deserve to stand where they stand eventually. Yeah. And I true. think that that's something that is grossly undervalued in absolutely any profession. Yeah, I mean, I've never thought of it that way. Um... Callie was right in stating that Generally. when I first started, <laughs> uh, that when I first started, she would state that I'm relatively naive or I was relatively naive. And, and I think I was, and, I, and to be honest, I still kind of feel that way. Um, Cause I personally don't think of it as, oh, I'm gonna come and take this person's job. I think of it more along the lines of like, oh, I respect you enough that I want you here with me. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I am of the belief that there's enough pie to go around, right? If if there's if any business model, if you're working hard enough and you gain the respect of your peers or gain the respect of other businesses around you, then I personally am still of the belief, as naive as it might be, that there is enough money to go around, there is enough business to go around. And I recognize that there are some markets that that's just not the case. And I do recognize that, that West Coast might be one of them uh, eventually, but- In the pie world, that is always the case. Yeah. I will always eat pie, and I hope there's always pie. <laughs> so yeah, as long as there's pie involved, we're good. Mm. But that's kind of how I think of it. But I've never actually thought of it that way. That that's a really interesting thought process of oh hey like they're respecting you enough to thinking that you could take their position. Yeah. Um, I just never thought of it that way. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, what is something that you wish someone would have told you before you had started this journey? And I mean specifically in the realm of going from dancing as a hobby to a business. Um, you're actually going to hate me for this because okay. you actually did kind of tell me this. Um, Tears. <laughs> I, I wish that I would have been more aware of the idea behind the harder you work, the faster you get there. Uh, I very much viewed West Coast as a normal as a normal job where it's like oh you pay your dues you start your first year and then and then you work your way up do your and six you, month training exactly and then, you're, and, then, and then you have your peer review or your or whatever and, and you just stay in that job yeah and you just work your way up and so i never really had that fire to just move as fast as possible i know that Callie and i had a conversation extremely early on within our partnership and it was where we had our biggest disagreement and we didn't realize this so if you didn't know, if you didn't listen to our previous episode, uh, Callie specifically came to me and was like, this is what I'm expecting in a partner, this is what I want. And I was like, I'm game, cool. Well, we left out one crucial part, which is how we expected to get there. While I viewed it as, okay, we're gonna enjoy this journey and it's gonna take some time and that's okay. And we're gonna stop and smell the roses and, and we're getting our feet wet the first year and all this other stuff. While Callie's perspective was, I'm a-okay with my life sucking for X amount of time and I'm just going to work as hard as possible in that time so I can get to the goal as fast as possible so then I can be at the promised land, right? And that wasn't my goal, that wasn't my thought process. And I didn't see the benefits of her viewpoint and I wish that that's the one thing that I could go back and change would be the fact that not using the excuse of, oh well, they've been doing it for so much longer, so it's not like I'm supposed to be beating them, or it's not like I'm supposed to be at the same level as them, because they've been doing it for so much longer than us. It's the um, schoolyard effect, where you go, oh, well I'm not in 11th grade, so therefore I don't have to know what 11th grader is gonna know till I get there. Yeah, I guess, and, and that's that's something that, that I wish I could go back to, or change, would be the fact that, hey, if I would have really buckled down, if I would have started working out earlier, if I would have started really practicing a lot by myself and not just during our practices, then we would be so much further, so much faster. Um, and I, I, I can only speculate that that's the truth. I, I don't have raw information that's stating, yes, that is accurate. I mean, you've 100%. seen people do it though. Yeah, but so I think that that's what, 
the number one thing that I would change. Um, and that goes for anything, actually. Just, I, I had this conversation with my dad when we were, me and my dad every year go to the Texas football championship games during uh, Thanksgiving. Every year, it's, it's like him and I's tradition. And this past year, he asked if being at the games was just different now that I'm so far removed from high school. And I was like, yeah, I wish I could go back and tell high school Austin that if you actually apply yourself to anything, just pick something and be great at it, and it will result in so much more than just leisurely going through your life without any goals. And that goes for West Coast, that goes for any business model, that goes for any education. If you really just pick something and apply it and pursue that goal, you're going to get there a lot faster than if you just, oh, well, I guess I, I like this and I kind of like that and, and this is okay and I'll just enjoy myself while I get there. Um, I think that would be the biggest piece of information that I wish I would have gone into with this knowing, I guess. Mm. I think for me, it's very, very simple. I wish that somebody would have told me that you're never going to be satisfied with where you're at. Just, just point blank. As I'm not, I'm not a settler type person. That's not my personality. It never will be my personality. You could tell me, hey, sit here and play Tetris. And I won't be happy until I have number one person in the world at Tetris. It does not matter what you give me. I am competitive to a T in absolutely everything I do. And so I think if someone had told me a long time ago, hey, you're never gonna be you know, okay with where you're at. You're always gonna want more. I think I would be less hard on myself. Yeah. Because that's something that I, every single day I wake up and that kind of eats at me and I'm like, oh, I'm not where I want to be. Oh, we got to go harder. Oh, this isn't enough. And I think working, I work 25 hours a day, eight days a week, 367 days a week. You know, that's, that's how I go. And if you're doing the math, there's not enough time in a day to get everything done that I want to get done. Yeah. That's the whole point is that it will never be enough. Yeah. And I wish I would have just like took that little chill pill. I, I still haven't. I don't know where they get those, but I haven't taken one. <laughs> if you can tell, Callie and I are pretty much exact opposites where I was like, oh, I wish that I would go harder and not as relaxed and see the roses. And she was like, oh, I wish I would have gone a little bit more relaxed to see the roses. We even I don't that. want to see the roses. I have no interest in them. That's fine. The relaxed part. Just the drive through to part. get a snow cone. That's all. There you go. Stop by a drive through at some point. Compromise. Run the, run the roses over. I don't care about them. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. <laughs> Very, very clean transition. Oh, I'm a great transitioner, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to follow us on Facebook, we're at KNA Swing, uh, YouTube KNA Swing, and then we'll be posting this on Podbean, Spotify, all those places for our podcast. So. Yeah, you can also check us out. Um, we both have Snapchats. We'll just put it down below. Instagram, put it down below. You can watch our journeys, watch our goofiness obviously you're listening to a person with a neon pink cow so his name is max he yeah it's a, it's a dude <laughs> he laughs and it's callie's favorite thing <laughs> anyway thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time see y'all